to another edition of our Friday night forging live stream. It, it, we have one of these every Friday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hopefully we've gotten all of our computer issues figured out this time around. Uh, what it turned out to be is we were pushing too much CPU. Uh, our OBS software was trying to run the computer too hard. So we had to change some settings in there, or I, should I say my lovely wife, Jessica? Say hello, Jessica. Hi, guys. Uh, Jessica yeah. had to change some settings. Mm -hmm. um, so for anybody who's watching this on the replay, I'm Roy Adams, Christ Center Ironworks. That's Jessica Adams of Christ Center Ironworks, my wife. Tonight we are going to be continuing on something that we should have finished a couple uh, live streams ago, which was a wrought iron hammer with steel faces welded in. Uh, these faces that we'll be welding in are 1095 steel faces, and usually I would do it with 1045, but I had 1095 in the proper size stock, so we're going to do 1095 faces. So we'll give everybody a chance to come in here a little bit. I've got my wrought iron piece already in the preheat. We will put a link in the description down below to part one and two. We yep. had a break up there. Yeah, it's already down there. Up there. So, yeah, so the links are down in the description if you need to go back and reference those later on after this stream is over. When it gets published to YouTube, that'd be a good thing. Yeah. So I've got some pieces in the preheat here, and i got to make sure that they, I keep building the fire, but I've got my wrought iron piece on preheat. I'm going to shove it over here in the ashes to just keep it keep it warm for the time being while I build back up my fire a bit. Whatever you're doing forge welding, it takes quite a bit of coke to do this. So you got to have proper fire maintenance. We're all right. 20 so far. So. 20 people watching. All right. So who do we have in the chat, huh? All right. We have uh, Jacob THT. Jacob THT. Good to have you in the the house this evening, or the forge, I should say, forge, this evening. Yeah. Uh, Graham Pepper. Graham Pepper. As always, it's a pleasure to see you here in the stream, sir. We have Luth, Brian Neely, Billy Strong. Luth, Brian Neely, Billy Strong. All of our regulars. Yep. Yeah. I love having all of our regulars with us. Ben Tubes, Michael Martin, Jason, Jason Hill. Awesome, awesome. Good to have you all here. Jason Hill, good to see you. North Country Forge says, good evening, Jess and Roy. Glad you got everything straightened down. Yes, we are glad too, aren't we, hon? Yes, we are. Yep. Yeah, um, we did do our Business Monday live stream, and it went smoothly, so we were happy for that. And yep. we still had... Uh, about the average amount of people join us, uh, despite the fact it's Memorial Day, so it was a good yep. live stream then. Yep, it most certainly was. So. Let's see, we also have Keith Devers, Susan Ellis. Keith Devers, good to have you here. Susan Ellis, good to see you all once again. Thank you all for being here. So we're going to continue our little wrought iron hammer here, and uh, really great, I really greatly appreciate everybody showing up to the stream tonight. Um, just a real quick recap, hopefully everybody can see that. In fact, let's go to the lower camera, Jessica, and Volcam. So this is the shape that we are going for. This is a Scandinavian style cross peen. Um, this is perhaps probably my favorite shaped hammer out of all the hammers in my collection. I really enjoy this shape here. And this here is for my uh, making locks. I use this for peening pins and uh, rivets and small little components and stuff for, for reach because it's got a really nice long peen on it mm -hmm. that allows you to get right into the little nooks and crannies. So that's what we're shooting for, anyhow. All right. Scott Grundy says hello from Toledo. Hello, Scott Grundy. All the way from Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> Let's see. Good uh, to have you this evening. James Douglas says, hi, all Saturday morning viewing in Australia. Cheers. Aha, cheers. Welcome to being a, a whole day ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. You got a head start on us. Yep. LFA says, good to see you live. Yeah. It's good to see us live, too. <laughs> We're beginning to think that we had all this money invested and I was, wasn't going to have to have to go back to a uh, cell phone cam for live streams. 
I didn't want to do that. I not at all. I suggested that, and he was like, no. No, nope, yeah. I said, absolutely not. <laughs> when in doubt, throw more money at it. That's what I say. Or time. I guess it was. Or time. So. Uh, Troy T says, good evening, Roy and Jess. What happened to Roy? Just the hat to get a new haircut. Looks good. <laughs> He did. Well, he styled his hair today. Yeah, I styled my hair today. Um, the hat is leather, and so therefore it is quite sweaty during the summer months on top of my head. So uh, doing the do today and probably the rest of the live streams you see this summer. And you might even see me when I go bald. So I do shave it from time to time and shave all the hair off completely. So Jessica doesn't like that as much. She deals with it every now and then, but... I do. Yeah. I can rock the look. I can go skid row on everybody and still look good. At least I think so. Sleepless in New York says, hey, congrats, 22,000 subs. Aren't we a motley crew? Smiley yes, face. we are. We are a very motley crew. Justin Wells, whoa, awesome cam, Jess. Yeah, um, yeah, if you haven't been in our live streams lately, and it's been a while, uh, we have changed from using just the cell phone cam, and yep. now we have a multiple camera setup. Uh, the little picture you see of me, that's probably the lowest quality one just because it's the webcam uh, versus our actual other cameras that are set yep. up around the shop. But. So, so we're running and we're streaming two camera angles at 1080p 60 frames a second, and that's going into the computer and it's getting processed down to a 1080p at 30 frames a second. And then that gets uploaded to YouTube at 720p at 30 frames per second. So you're taking all those pixels and you're condensing them like this as they go down until they get to you and it, require, and it makes a really buttery smooth image on your end. Or should, hopefully, that's the way it's supposed to work out. Mm -hmm. uh, when you got all your bit rates and yep. craziness, craziness it's set up. So uh, I never it's like... Any of this before. We start live it, you you get year. like a college education in this when you start live streaming because mm -hmm. good lord there's a lot to it but uh, yeah so we got two Limaxes G7s going opposed to what I was filming on before which was the LG V20 which was just my smartphone and that's and it had only like I think it had a eight megapixel rear camera and that's what I did all my streaming on. Um, when you were to look at me and it got all granulated at night and things like that as where this type stuff uh, I think both of these cameras have 16 megapixel uh, cameras which is on a big sensor sorry talking tech really good image quality let's just <laughs> say you that You're yeah. Rambling. They're like, yada 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 <laughs> yeah I'm rambling <laughs> hashtag not sponsored there, there I go. made it better that covers it Oh, all right. So while everybody coming in here, uh, last live stream that we actually had a good live stream that we were working on this, uh, I cut barbs into the high carbon tool steel bit. Now that's going to be the face, and we're going to take and weld these up tonight. Hopefully, I'm hoping to get through most of the shaping of the hammer um, this evening. If I don't. If I don't, we'll do another live stream where we'll do the other end or the peen end of it. So we're working on the face of the hammer tonight, which will be this end here. And then we will work, hopefully we can get far enough that we can work on the peen section itself. Really look forward to doing that. I like getting this shape in uh, when I can. Um, you have to take and pre-shape this before you drift the hole. Uh, if you don't, if you don't pre-shape it first, what ends up happening when you drift the hole, it's hard to get this crown or this peak that you see on this hammer to, to come out and look nicely. So there's a lot of curvatures in this, a lot of good looks to it. And like I said, one of my favorite hammers, bar none. Mm -hmm. So I've got this piece, I've got the face heated up. The first step in this process, you want to take your 20 mil team borax, dirty as it may be, Okay, take your 20 mule team borax, and what we're going to do is we're going to sprinkle very lightly, just lightly, enough to get a little candy caramelized coating on the surface of the face of the hammer. Then we're going to set that piece down across to the side 
to stay at like a black heat. We're just going to set it off somewhere so this way it can just be a lot cooler than the wrought iron body. Then what we'll do is we'll shove the wrought iron body in the forge and we will bring it up to like a really bright forging color and temperature and we will hammer it down on the barbs of the face. And what that will do for us is that will allow that face to lock in to that wrought iron hammer enough that it can hold together as we put it in the fire and bring the whole piece then up to forge welding temperature to weld it at the anvil. So that's this order of operation. If you need to have me say all that again, watch it on the replay. Watch it on the replay. I'm sure we'll have somebody in about another 30 minutes come in and ask. <laughs> Let's see, Keith Dever says, too high-tech for this redneck. <laughs> now, I bet you all never knew there was this much into doing YouTube. So, um, you can do it very, you can do it. I had 500 videos I shot, filmed, and produced on the LG V20, my phone. That's the smartphone. So, there's 500 videos worth of content on this channel. My earlier videos include coming on up that were all shot on that LG V20. And we are at, I forget what we're at, we're at 766 videos right now? So. I think we're at 766 videos. So the last 266 videos, if you will, have all been on these Lumex, the new Lumexes. So if you haven't watched some of my more current videos, you might want to go back in the libraries and watch kind of like plus this year, probably what, spring of this year? Mm -hmm we made the switch. So about spring of this year on, we made the switch to doing much better quality filming with this stuff. So Graham, he gave us a $2 super chat and said, good to see my money is going to good use. <laughs> it is, Graham. So, and I'll go ahead and make mention of that since, since Graham already, you know, paid a little super chat there. That super chat goes to taking bettering the camera equipment. So we are taking those super chat donations that you guys have been gracious to take and put in the comment section down below. That's the little dollar sign that's right off to the side of your, uh, you know, your text box where you can add a, what you want to say. And you can type in a question for us for some money. I think the lowest is what, a dollar? Something I think like it's that. like a dollar super chat. And that donates money to us at a 70-30% split, right? That's what it is. So we get 70% of every dollar that you donate, and that allows us to buy better equipment and constantly improve streams and improve video quality on YouTube and uh, making blacksmithing information about business and life and inspiration and tooling and projects and techniques and tips more accessible to everyone out there. So guys that support us on the regular Graham, and I'll segue after I sprinkle some flux on this hammer face here. You can switch over to the switch over to the anvil test. Alright. If you want. And I'll keep talking here. Sounds good. Um, guys like Graham and a bunch of others that come in here on the weekly basis and support us. You can thank them and give them a hand clap of applause in the comment section because they're making streams like this possible. They allow us to do better and better and better quality, which is ultimately what I'm after. Yeah, definitely. One of the next things that Roy would like to get is a uh, certain type of microphone. Was that a lapel mic or? Yeah, a wireless or... lapel system, lapel mic system. So this way it doesn't sound like I'm shouting sometimes and then I'm too quiet other times. It'll be a lot quieter for everyone. Hmm. Yep. Sleepless in New York says, live stream tech is a major learning. A lot of trial and error to get it right. Yep. Exactly. That's a very good explanation of it. Okay. You can switch back to the main cam show. Okay. John Blanche says, what's up? Been in the near sight of forever since I've caught a live stream. The feed looks incredible. Yeah, good to have you here, John Blanche. Yeah, we did a lot of upgrading store equipment. We just got done talking about that, didn't we? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Uh, let's see, who else do we have? We have a few more. Rusty Pearson's joining us. 
Austin Rusty, good to have you in the house. Thomas Downing Watchtower. Thomas Downing Watchtower, good to have you. Earth Page. Earth Page, a pleasure as always, sir. Let's see, we also have B B and B Forge, Jacob THT, and Lynn Brownstead. We haven't said hi to you all yet. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you all for being here. I would take and say hi to absolutely everyone on the stream, except for that it would take me all night and all two hours. And you don't want to see me run my mouth, you just want to see me forge, so. <laughs> Clay Sapp, Deep Iron Forces, how y'all doing? Doing good, Clay Sapp. Doing really good, really well. Looking for, ah, there we go. Changed my tongue position. Billy Strong says, wow, y'all are getting high tech. Yep, very high tech. Like that. Back. Uh, so you guys just drop down in the comments. Let me know, make sure the audio is coming in clear and that it matches up too. And that way yep. I just know I don't need to adjust anything. Uh, Mike G says, hey Jessica, the live stream picture looks perfect on my parents' big TV. Awesome. We love big screens when we look good on big screens. Yeah. Huh. Yep. Yep. Gotta love that. Thomas Doubting Watchtower says, I recently just subscribed. Awesome. Nice to have you. Glad to have you just recently subscribing. This is something we do every Friday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we do a Monday night live stream business live stream to help you with your blacksmithing business questions. Every Monday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as long as we've got great streaming. <laughs> weather and quality and things like that. As long as it all works together, which is normal. So make sure to hit that bell for notifications if you'd like to see more of our content. Oh. All right, I'm going to segue into thanking some of, I ought to just call them our sponsors, man, because <laughs> that's what they are. They come show up all the time and support us in Super Chat. So mm -hmm. let me go ahead and thank some people here uh, that have recently supported us in the last 30 days of Super Chat. We greatly appreciate every last one of you. Um, you may hear a lot of names again. That's because sometimes, again, they support every week yeah, on a weekly basis. And then there's, uh, again, you know, they kind of feed through and they drop off at the end of the month. But uh, we have Graham Pepper. And I want everybody to give these people a hand clap in the comment section down below and just thank them. Uh, Graham Pepper, Average America, or American, mm -hmm. I think it is. Man. Ben Colt, Angela Adams, that's my mom. <laughs> Technomatic, Energy Management, Josh Wright, Carol Johnson, Evan Coughlin, 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 I think Coughlin, it's Coughlin. Yeah. Uh, North County Forge, 35 millimeter showdown, Landon, Coffee's Forge, Jason Hill, and Big Dog Forge. Tim over at Big Dog Forge. Thank you all very much for all your support. You make streams like this a possibility. We greatly appreciate it. All right. You good? Yeah. Everybody all right? Yeah. Yeah, we're good. OK. Well, let's go over to the anvil cam now. All right. So I've got my wrought iron all heated up here. And I'm going to pull it out of the fire. The can, if I don't drop it to the bottom. Just did. Oh, no. Got it, though. All right. So this is at a high forging heat, but not a forge welding heat. I'm going to get it lined up with my face and give it a tap. And that tap holds it on. Now I don't like how that looks. I hope I can get that to... Sometimes you can chance it. There we go. That sits a little bit better. So now that's on there. Now I can take this back in. The reason for, I'll talk about this as I put this back in. The reason why you want to do this like this is because the high carbon steel will heat up quicker. The high carbon steel is going to heat up quicker than what the low carbon steel will. <coughs> so what that means is, and this is wrought iron, so I'm used to saying steel because I work predominantly with mild steel, um, modern steel now, but uh, what I wanted to say about that is that the 
the high carbon steel will heat a lot quicker than what the lower carbon or the no carbon, if you will, content uh, wrought iron will. So if you bring, if you were to test, take and put that 1095 face straight on there and just maybe put a couple tack welds around it, what you're going to do is you're going to be introducing a lot of grain growth on the higher carbon steel and it will have a higher probability of burning. It's going to burn on the end before the wrought iron ever gets up to forge welding temperature. So you need to take and have that base cooler than what the wrought iron body is. So this way it'll come up to temp at the same time the wrought iron gets to forge welding heat. So the wrought iron basically has to be closer to forge welding heat now than what the face does. And then when you join the two and you put them in the fire, you bring them up to full welding heat and then weld them in. Hopefully that makes sense. If you need questions answered, shoot them at Jess there in the comment section down below. Drop them in. I'm keeping an eye on it. Do like a hashtag weld question or something if you've got a question there. So now I'm going to gently position coke and insulate this in the fire so this way I can bring it up to a welding heat. Jacob THT says, sounds menacing when you hit the anvil like a loud boom. <laughs> Sleepless in New York says, good pro tip. I like it. Paul, uh, Gamery S3 says, big fan, thanks for focusing on teaching. You're a treasure, bro. You are very welcome. You are a treasure for being a part of the channel. John Fan says, I had no idea they would heat so differently. Yes, they will. So high carbon steel will heat up to the point. So wrought iron has such, the higher the carbon content in the material, the, the faster it will become or it will reach its melting point. It was wanting to get rid of those carbon atoms as fast as it can. It's got more meat in there to unpack, basically. The lower the carbon steel, the higher the temperature you can go with it before it reaches its melting point. And uh, that's pretty much the standard across the board. Be careful on blanket statements like that. I'm not talking about different alloys of steel. I am talking about simple and plain carbon steels. You can get something and stainless and some other weird whatever and mix and cockage. Stuff just, just all mixed up together. I'm not dealing with that. I'm dealing with simple, simple materials or what I call simple carbon steels. So the base of it is 1095. The body is going to be wrought iron, which has almost no carbon in it whatsoever. So you have to push wrought iron up to almost a white heat. At a white heat with wrought iron, the 1095 would be liquid. So, so there's a thin line right there to get that weld to take. 1045, as it has less points of carbon, it's closer mirrored image to, it, it's, it's lower down on that Richter scale so it can take more heat. So that's why it's a better suited choice for wrought iron, if you're gonna forge weld to wrought iron. Um, I may pay for this dearly for the fact that I, did take the time to run down some 1045 and I'm using 1095 instead, but we'll see if we can't make this weld anyhow. Grant asks, so the spikes you made go into the wrought iron? Yes, they dig into those wood fibers of the wrought iron and they lock in and they hold that hammer face on there so you can weld it. That way you don't have to tack weld it up and have those tack welds show up in your final piece. So one of the other things about working with wrought iron, wrought iron, likes to squirt that silica or that slag in it. It likes to oh, yeah. squirt that all over the place. So make sure if you're going to work with this, you have absolutely no flammables laying around. You'll be sorry if you do. Yes, I have experienced that when Roy was doing a class at Touchstone where they were working with wrought iron and like, yeah, you just don't stand nearby to watch because it just squirts everywhere. Yeah. Uh, let's see, there's a question about heat treating. Donald Roberts says, do you heat treat both the same? Uh, heat treat what both the same? 1095 and 1045? I think he's talking about maybe both parts of the hammer. God, so okay, I'd we'll be a little more later. specific. Okay. I'm almost up to a welding heat now. I'm not going to push it too far here. 
Now with this 1095, I'm actually pushing it a little higher than I'm wanting. So you may see some sparklers on this 1095. Um, this is just to ensure that I have enough heat in the wrought iron to get a weld. Basically it. So if I can get that first joint, that first initial butt welded joint to stick, uh, then we'll be in business and I can really start working it in and taking my time. Mr. Coffee. Good evening, Mr. Coffee. We're about to take this weld. So Jessica, go to the anvil cam. All right. Please. Now, since this piece, since this piece is just stuck on the front of here, it's not on there with any sort of mechanical adhesion whatsoever. So you need to, you need to uncover it in the fire. Don't just yank it or try to pick it right up and out. It might knock that little piece off and you lost it in the bottom of your fire. Um, so you need to give it a quick swipe. I've got some sparks here, so I'm going to go for this here. See what I can do. I'm going to uncover it a little bit. And up we go. Just give it a couple quick pops. We're going to get just a little more flux. Not a bunch. And we're going right back in the fire with it. All right, now I can answer questions. <laughs> All right. Um, let me see here. Mike G says, I've never forge welded a hammer face before. Now I might have to. Well, that's just forge welded. So that was just forge welded. I know that that was quick, but that's how you have to take and make welds. It's just uh, you have to make them quick. Dever says, can I use this technique to fix a raw iron hammer that's busted? Yes, you can. Uh, it's a little trickier with the hole in the center, but if you don't mind that getting a little wonky on you that you can have to re-drift it, yes, you can. You can use the same technique. John Blanche says, we've had a lot of issues trying to forge weld coil spring to stretch pieces of iron for Damascus. We've been really good about cleaning the material. This makes a lot of sense. Good. Peter Tricker says, good evening. This is the UK calling. Yeah. So, mo uh, hello, Peter Tricker. So, most, probably most likely a lot of your problem with that is um, if you're trying to layer something up like that with a high carbon and a really low carbon steel, your high carbon steel is burning. It's over oxidizing in the fire because it's been brought up at such a high temperature before your other metal's there. And then it's not going to stick at you. Um, it's going to burn and scale at the surface and it'll be very hard to get it to weld. So you want those temperatures to be really, really close. Really, really close. The welding temp of the one material to the welding temp of the other material needs to be really close within a few hundred degrees. If you can get it down to within a few hundred degrees, you're primo. You're in good shape. It'll weld as long as you adhere to good welding practices. Donald Roberts says um, and about the uh, heat treating. He said raw iron and 1095, no carbon and 1095 heat treat the same. I don't know what that meant. Give okay. me a second. Okay. I'm about to lose this piece again. Oh. Anvil. Sorry. All right, so I got that pretty much forge welded in. But I got to keep working it. I got to keep working it. Keep it at a very high heat. Don't let your fire burn hollow. And get it back in there. Don't let the piece get cool. Now, if you notice, and I don't know if you noticed with the first welding heat, if you noticed and did it show up on the camera, it was sparkling a little bit. Yeah. So that's a surface burn. Those really short little tiny firecrackers right at the surface, that's a surface burning. That's just the start of that material burning. Now, there's enough material here that I'm going to end up filing a lot of that away, so that does not affect the rest of the material. 
But if you were to keep it at that state and get to a full out where it's blowing off firecrackers like that, you're done. Pitch the piece, start again. Because you get it to that burning point, you have done oxygenized that piece to a point that it will do nothing but crack on you and crumble and throw chips across the shop and it's unsafe at that point. Do not use it. Pitch it. Pitch it in the scrap bucket, the, the learning experience bucket, and then uh, move on. Move on with life. It's okay to cry a little bit. I do that on occasion. Nothing unmanly about that. Just a part of the blacksmithing process. Herb Peach says, I hope it was cooler where you are, Roy, today than where he is. I had to work, lol. I forged like two minutes before I said it's too hot. <laughs> um, it was pretty much close to 90 all day today for me. So, my shop stays hot, and since I'm in it every single day, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty well acclimatized to it. Uh, the, where you get yourself, a way that you can get around that to acclimatize yourself for forging better is go outside and take a good brisk walk. And I mean a good brisk walk for like a good 20 minutes prior to actually getting in the shop. Yes, this means you're going to sweat. This means you're going to kind of get into that mode of stuff. Then go in the shop and start lighting your forge, especially if you're coming from an air-conditioned home or car or office or whatever uh, with modern conveniences as they are today with air conditioning, you know. So we're going to take several more welding heats with it on standing upright like this. The reason for that being is we need to make sure that block is almost pushed into that wrought iron, almost where it sucks down into that wrought iron a bit uh, to make sure that, that joint all the way around the outside is really pushed down into the wrought iron. That seam is really well mended. And then we will gently coax it in this direction or on the uh, on the sides. We'll gently forge on it to blend in that joint, to blend in the face. And then I'll show you guys how you can tell if it's welded or not. Our page says, like the tip right, thanks. Welcome. Okay, let's go with the anvil cam, Jessica. All right. Okay. Kick Scorch, glad, glad you're joining us. Good. Thank you, thank you. So it's not uncommon for these faces when you stick them, for them to get a little wonky or off to one side. It's not uncommon for these faces to get to one side or the other or you not get them perfectly square. Don't worry, wrought iron is really forgiving. You're going to be able to move and forge this material around to make it suit better. I'm having some problems out of this fire tonight. I didn't have enough cold coke build up for me working on this this evening. So, I just wanted to create some issues, some problems for me. All right, questions, comments, complaints. All right, Coffee's Forge, 111 days until Quad State. Getting excited? Yeah. I look forward to that. Anybody who's going to Sofa Quad State this year, it's my open invitation to you to come visit me at my tent. So um, I don't have a specific tent, but I'm not too hard of a guy to find around there. A lot of people know me. They can generally just say, hey, where are Roy at? And they can probably point you in my direction. 
or otherwise just listen to <laughs> listen for my lovely voice. Last year we took our big banana tent. So yeah, it's very tall. It it's an old Coleman. Pepper. It's an old Coleman tent. Yep. Really old Coleman tent. Yeah. Um, like 1970s ish era. It's a nice one though. I mean, it's done. It works. They don't build tents like they used to. Jonathan says, yeah, real men cry. There ain't nothing wrong with it. Love you guys. Keep harming away Roy. <laughs> well, do. Fishing Frenzy, or sorry, Frenzy Fishing says, you said you are going to make a pneumatic power hammer. When is that happening? Uh, as soon as I get the time. <laughs> so, um... I'm really bad about deadlines right now and schedules. Um, usually the summer months, they are my busiest months. Probably don't expect that till, unless I get a weird streak, don't expect that until sometime in the fall or winter. Uh, that's probably when I'll get into actually doing that. I wanted to get it done before I got busy this summer, but it's already starting to cook up to quite a busy, uh, busy, busy summer. I've got a a fireplace hood that I'm making for a client. Um, I've got door poles. I've got hammers that I'm making for guys, custom hammers uh, for people. Uh, I've got quite a bit on the go right now, plus managing the YouTube and two live streams and things like that. So it will be a while, so definitely don't hold your breath. Uh, if you do, make sure it's you still breathe through your nostrils. Somewhat on that. Man, that was really a loop answer, wasn't it? I, I think yeah. I played that off good. I didn't give any info there, did I? Um, yeah, expect more towards the fall. There. That's a simple answer. Huh? Okay. Let's see. Um, Earth Page says Funny part is, when I'm back at work and forging the heat, I'm wearing 1860s clothing, lol. <laughs> Coffee Sports says, are you going to be at the meeting tomorrow, Roy? Uh, no, I will not be at the meeting tomorrow. i got a bunch of uh, orders I'm trying to catch up on. So. And a family get-together. And a family get-together. Science Addict 77 says, what sort of problems is the fire giving you? Uh, right now, I don't have enough coke. I don't have enough coke in there to do a really good well on it. I need to build up a good coking fire. Problem is, I didn't get out here and time earlier to do that before we started the stream and so that's the problems that it's giving me right now if you don't have enough coke down in the center of the hearth you get too much oxygen up through and then that ends up scaling the piece because it's over oxygenizing it it burns it and then therefore uh, you can't make really good forge welds that way also without enough coke there's not enough heat to bring the mass to welding heat. So. all right let's go to the anvil jessica I think this is up to a good heat here. Bring it up this final little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and do another 412 on it. You ready? Yep, we're there. So, okay, let me swipe this off clean. So now that we've done several welding heats, you can go ahead, you can afford to be a little rougher on this to make sure. If it's going to blow apart, you want to find out now, not six months from now. You still have to be gentle with it. You still have to be a little gentle as you're forging it on the sides until you know that you know that it's forged on there. But there's a pretty, pretty good assurity that it's on there right now. So now I'll go ahead and show you how you can tell if it didn't stick. We're going to find out right now. Put Roy's money where his mouth is, eh? <coughs> so as you watch this cool down. Graham actually commented on that. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. Okay. As you watch this piece cools down, this piece here, the face, should cool at the same rate or look nice and even as this unwelded in. It should cool down all at the same rate like it's doing there. If you get a cold line show up here, like a dark line, 
where this whole piece is cooled off and this here hasn't even begun to cool off yet, it is not forge welded. Don't proceed any further with it. Get it forge welded. Because all it's going to do for you is fall off at a later date. So as you can see, it's all cooling down in the same color temperature. Right? Graham's comment he had added on to that was, so the same is true here about the two different colors, or is the wrought iron and 1095 welt big, too, different, too, uh, too big of a difference to go by that? On the color temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, no, when you, when you weld these two together, they do become one piece, okay? So basically, basically what happens here at the transition of the weld is you get some carbon migration from this piece here, the high carbon steel face, to the wrought iron. You get some carbon migration into the wrought iron here. And so what it does is it kind of creates a blend, if you will, right here at the weld. Much in the same way of kind of like how you use filler wire in a like a MIG welder or a stick welder, right? You use some filler material to join two pieces, well that, that filler material is comprised of a lot of other stuff in it. So it, like if you etch it, you'll see the weld because it's a mix of the two pieces being joined with the filler material. In this case, it's the carbon migration that becomes a little bit of filler material. And if you etch these, if you etch this, what you'll see is you'll see almost like a little white silver streak, almost like a little streak where those two come together. And sometimes it's not silver, sometimes it's a dark streak. When you etch it, there'll be it'll be like gray over here. This will be like wrought iron and looking all wrought iron like. And there'll be like a black streak right here where those two are welded. That is where that those two surfaces flowed together, the wrought iron surface and the high carbon steel surface. That's why I say, if this here is just sitting on here and it's black as all can get out, but this is still a bright red, this isn't welded. Mm -hmm. Because they will then, that transition area that's been welded in should cool at the same rate. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. And say hello to Mr. Thing. Yeah. Hi, guys. Where's the finger? There's a finger. So. There it is. All right. So we've got that face welded on there. That's pretty good and welded on. It's stuck. Uh, if anybody's got any questions about that, this is a great time to have your forge welding questions answered by me. Um, put, trying to put a lot of info out here for you guys and gals. Uh, yeah, Sleepless in New York says, now we're on the quench. Yeah. Joey had his hard face pop on the quench. It wasn't welded then. I wanted to touch on my last comment. Joey is an incredible smith. Sometimes poop happens. Yeah, yeah. And Joey is a, Joey Van Der Poop is an awesome smith in his own right. Um, he's got a lot of learning to do yet, but I don't really see him as the type of guy that's high on himself. So at no point has he ever really portrayed himself as a know-it-all. You know, he he knows what he knows, and then you know what he doesn't know. He puts out there on the web to learn together, both his failures and his um, successes. And that is, that is awesome about his character right there. Because even if, let's say, you do this live, so you, know, you think it's tough to forge weld while you're all by yourself in your shop alone, um, do it at a live demonstration anytime. Uh, try to do it in front of a camera first. It's even worse. I mean, it's it's really bad then, but at least you can edit it out, right? Like if something just popped off, you're like, oh crud, I'll go over there and just put a couple MIG tacks on there and get it welded in and go on to my next clip. So that way it doesn't look like I was a big buffoon. But in live, you don't get that safety curtain. So, <coughs> um, so you might very well, and there's a good chance of it, you'll see me eat humble pie at some point in time. If you watch me long enough, it happens to everyone. Uh, but if your face pops off your hammer, it was not welded. It was not solidly welded. That little trick that I just showed you there, share that with Joey. And I bet you if he would have done that, his face would have cool it would have been cooling off quicker than what the body of his hammer was, 
and it would have shown clearly that it was not fully welded in. Um, that's, uh, again, that's a big, big mistake. I learned this from Tom Latine. Uh I had a face when I was first trying to get my, my hammer welded up, this one here. This I use every day, and I have for the last, what, seven, eight years now? Mm -hmm. Is that how long I've had this hammer? I think so. <coughs> Pretty close to. It may not be quite that old. Six years. Yeah. Yeah, because I've been doing it for ten years. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so six years. Mm -hmm. So this, every day in my shop for the last six years, six days a week, uh, predominantly, is a 1045 face welded onto a wrought iron uh, body with a 1045 peen welded in. And I've used this every day for the last six years. This is my go-to hammer. This is my main shop hammer. Um, and what I say about that is if my face wasn't welded in, it wouldn't even last it a month. First time I went to go whack on something, it would pop off. Mm -hmm. uh, but I quenched this in water. I did a water quench with it, which is perfectly fine. As I said, you should be able, if it is welded, none of that will matter. If none of that will matter. It should never separate. <coughs> so that little dark line is crucial. You see that little dark line? That's something you got to watch out for, pay attention for. So now I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to try to build up some coke here because I need to get, start welding in these sides. So bear with me for a minute there, ladies and gents. i got to break this fire up and get some get some coke and lays here. Hello, Andrew Freeman and Tucker Matic. Good to have you. Good to have you all. Thank you for being here. <coughs> Corey Shire, thing is doing well. Let's film up. Thing. Thing Adams. Yeah, Thing Adams. Yep. yep. Thing is doing wonderful. Thomas. Uh, Dowdy Watchtower, I think you guys would enjoy the Northman YouTube channel. It's all about crafts like blacksmithing, woodworking, and other things. I just found out recently. Yep, yeah, I've been a subscriber of theirs for the past five years. Mm -hmm. I think so, yep. Yeah, quite a, quite Good a channel, place. yep. Thank you for the recommendation. Okay, good. You have some water. I was going to ask if you need me to go get you some. Nope, I'm good. I got it, I think. Okay. Um, fresh fishing, frenzy fishing, sorry, I don't know why I keep getting that swap. Asked about, uh, made mention of cooling the tongs and is there a higher likelihood of it causing cracks? Cooling my tongs? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm cooling my tongs just to this, they're getting hot up the handle because they're laying up here on the forge. Uh, no, they're all mild steel tongs, so they won't crack just because you cool them down. They're nowhere close to critical temperature or anything else like that. So even if they were made out of a higher carbon steel, you're not going to have any problems out of that. That's why I predominantly make all my tongs out of mild steel in my shop. There's a few specialty tongs that I don't do that with, uh, but again, they're specialty. They're like scrolling tongs. Scrolling tongs do better to be made out of a higher carbon steel. Um, just because if you're trying to get down to really finessey little tips, those tips have a tendency to want to bend on you if you work the piece too cold uh, that you're working on. But as long as you keep the tips thick enough on my old steel scrolling tongs, they work just as well. Let's see, Justin Wells says, why the wrought iron? It seems like um, it would be easier to just use 1045 for the whole thing. Um, well, wrought iron is a traditional method. This is a traditional way of actually making a hammer. It's using wrought iron as your body and then with the thought process of when high carbon steel was hard to get produce or manufacture and therefore it was more expensive than wrought iron was, uh, it makes sense that they would weld stuff together and they would just put little thin caps of stuff just so they could get some hardness out of it and some longevity out of the tool. Um, so that's, that's why for wrought iron. Other than that, actually wrought iron is a beautiful material to work. Um, I punched this entire hole in one heat on this chunk by myself. No striker, no nothing. I mean, literally, I mean, 
whack, 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 and I mean three pound hammer, and it was, psh, it was to the anvil, flipped it over, knocked the slug out, and I drifted it in the next heat by myself. If that was 1045, hang up your hat on that. You're not doing that unless you got a power hammer um, or a press or something like that to be able to do that. Or a striker. You could possibly do it with a striker if the heat was high enough. Jeffrey Sawyer, glad to have you. Uh, he says it's his first live stream with us. And the green tape is just an identifier for when Roy teaches classes or does demonstrations. Yep. So can easily find his tools when it's cleanup time. Yeah. Graham Pepper says, now wrought iron is expensive stuff. Yes, it is. So the wrought iron, the particular wrought iron that I'm using right now is, is coming off of a bridge. Um, it came off of a bridge that was built in 1906. It was torn down in like the early 80s, I guess it was. I want to say it was the early 80s uh, to early 90s. I think it was the late 80s to early 90s, if I get it right. Um, and it's really good quality stuff. There are some really cruddy walk, uh, rod iron out there that it always has a tendency to have inclusions and split and want to do things on you. Uh, I have not had that problem with this any of this bridge stuff because, let's face it, they were building a bridge so they knew it had to be good stuff. They weren't going to put things that could fail um, into it. So if you can get your hands on it, it's great. I've got about 140 pounds of it that I have been collecting. I uh, get it from a guy, um, Keith Summers is the guy's name, at Quad State every year. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you where my stash is, you can just find it yourself when you're there. If I haven't bought it all, I usually buy everything he has whenever he shows up. So yeah. I buy as much as I can. In fact, uh, the last couple Quad States I've bought more, I've given him more of my money than I have on any other tool. Just because I love wrought iron. I love working with it. Beautiful stuff. Okay. I'm almost there, ladies and gents. What else, huh? Yeah. Um, Micah Darwin says, glad to see Christ centered in your name. Could you give a short testimony on Reformed Baptist? All right. So, good. Good question. Uh, yeah. So, so, my testimony on that is the reason why I put Christ Centered in, in the name of my uh, business is because I wanted to keep them at the forefront of everything I did. And at the time that I got started blacksmithing, I committed my life back to the Lord. And I wanted that to be a, how do I want to say, I wanted that to be, what are they, to help keep me accountable in business. And not only in business, but in my faith. Um, because there's a lot of responsibility with that and to always be reminded that there's a lot of responsibility in the words that I say, right? And the things that I do and how I interact with people and that I want to take and interact with people and treat people how I would like to be treated myself and treat them very Christ-like, like Christ would treat somebody else. So if you're on my channel and even if you're not, uh, not a Christian, that's perfectly okay. You're never going to find me taking and belittling you on this channel. Um, I believe in, you know, pretty much preaching it exactly the way Christ did, and that is to love God first with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. And those are the two greatest commandments, and you can hang all the other laws on them. And so I believe that a thousand percent, and so that's kind of my testimony. I hope that's appeases somebody out there um, but I try to keep the channel as neutral as I can there is no there is no doubt about it if you have any questions about that or you need prayer or any type stuff like that I'm always here uh, I you can email me it's tough for us to get back with emails we do see them and we do pray for people that have emailed us in that way um, and you know we're just trying to show a little bit of love out there to you know, a world where there's not a whole lot, apparently. In fact, I just dealt with a guy earlier today that uh, uh, was throwing my Christianity in my face because my prices are high on my online website. So, um, had to deal with uh, snarky people. But it's a, it's amazing 
it's amazing how much hurt there is out there and how much negativity and how many channels and how much on YouTube people promote negativity around. And that's something I never want my channel to be about. I want my channel to be a place where it's safe for everyone, no matter your background, your color, your creed, your gender, your persuasion, none of that garbage matters. We are all a family of blacksmiths on this channel and everyone deserves equal respect because of it. So that's Jessica and I's both hearts. So that, there's my testimony. Now I'll, now I'll shut up and stop waffling on. And now to get back to work. Now back to the hammering if I can find my top in the bucket. That's the only problem with putting them in your slack tub. Sometimes you forget they're in your slack tub. John McCann says, preach it. Hallelujah. Amen. Good. Justin Wells says, awesome testimony, Roy. Glad you all enjoyed it. Okay, see you later, John. Enjoy your dinner. John, thanks for stopping in, buddy. Sorry you didn't stick around for the whole bit, but it's all right. Man's got to eat. So how long have we been in, honey? We have been 55 minutes. 55 minutes. So we're doing real good. Good. Yeah, we are. We have 59 watching currently. 59 people watching. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, also, again, I want you all to take and thank the people that have done the Super Chat donations and thank the people that you see that are constantly supporting the streams and on the comment sections of YouTube videos and stuff like that. Just make sure you just give them a thanks if you can. Um, sometime this week. It'd be great. That's, that, you know, I think everybody appreciates being appreciated. Uh, Technomatic asked if you were to etch it, would you see a pattern? Yes, you would. Um, you wouldn't see a pattern necessarily. What you would see is you would see the face, which would pretty much just be gray. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It would just be a, a, a grayish color, right? The high carbon steel face. Then you would see that little black, blah, 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 the little black or silverish type line, like I said, depends on the, on the material sometimes, uh, whether it comes up black or the silvery color where that line of that fusion happened. And then you would see a wood grain, a wood-like grain structure. And if you etched it enough, since the high carbon steel has a little higher resistance to that acid where the wrought iron does not, it would get real heavily, um, I want to say, it would actually get really heavily wood grain like. It would really develop a lot of weird pits and interesting stuff. And people have done that. People have done that. Uh, I know a guy who did a Damascus face, so he had some, uh, he had actually made up some mosaic Damascus. And so he took, and this was actually in class with Tom Latine. Um, he took some mosaic Damascus and he forged well that onto wrought iron and then he etched the whole thing when he was done. Uh, and it looked really superior. I mean, it looked great. It, it was definitely an interesting and unique camera to look at. Up on the I think it's time for me to go eat too. Keep cool and great info. Hey, good. Glad to have you here. Thank you for coming out and stopping and seeing us this evening. Enjoy your food. We'll be here hopefully for the whole two hours. See, I had to, somebody had asked if I could get the fire where it was all the way in frame, so I was like, I'll have to move the camera a little. Okay. So basically, it's always a trick to pry, try to get this <coughs> this fire right now. It's always just, it's breaking down. So you constantly got to feed the core and set the material on top. Because of it being heavier, and if you work with a big block of wrought iron or steel trying to get do the forge welding, it always likes to want to settle to the bottom. So you always got to pick it up, scoop some more coke underneath it, bury it, and it just wants to keep going down like that. So, I think we're almost up to a good welding heat here. Big important thing is just make sure you don't get let it drop all the way to the bottom. 
That's all that matters. And keep it covered and insulated. What's going on out there, Jess? Radio was, silence over there. Yes, Sugar. I was making sure I was. I got a little update thing in the corner of my computer, and I was trying to make sure it wasn't going to do something silly. Um, I think we're good. It was just a little notification about a uh, HP update of some sort. So okay, good. Well, we hopefully that's. Update. We don't need any updates right now. Um, <laughs> yep. Let's hopefully that doesn't try to update, huh? Justin Wells says, "How small a material should I start with when I just learned to forge weld?" Um, I would recommend starting off with half inch. Um, that's a good size. It's not too laborious to bring up to a welding temp, and it's not so small that it loses heat super quickly. Uh, like I said, that's a good size. Five eighths, you'll have an easier time welding, but again, you've got to get it hotter. I mean, you've got to be able to get it up to the welding temp for, in the first place. So I don't know what your what your forging capabilities are as far as what type of forge you're working in and stuff like that. Uh, but if you've got a good deep fire pot that has a lot of coke in it, you can bring up some pretty large chunks of steel up to forge welding. So I would recommend half inch for just starting. Let's see. Uh, Mike says, yay, finally made it to the live show. Yeah, good to have you here, Mike. Graham says, do you have coal next to your forge or is only coal storage outside? The only coal storage is outside. You bring it in just for the stream and throw up a couple shovel pools. So. All right, let's go to the anvil cam, honey. All right. <coughs> so now we got this up to a welding temp again, yet again. Now we're gonna start working the faces. Working the sides into the face. You wanna keep this at a nice high welding heat if you can at all times. When you're working on this, wrought iron likes to be hot. Just going to dress this back to shape. And so now since we've got that dressed back into plane with one another, now we'll take another welding heat and hammer it down from on top. Going to clean this up, throw a little bit more flux on there, just at that transition line because I'm trying to get those lines to suck together of the scarf and blend in. It doesn't take a lot of flux. LFA, um, asking about aprons. Roy actually did a video on aprons. He talked about a couple of different kinds he has. Um, so if you type in Christ Centered Ironworks shop aprons or just go to our page and the little search button there, you can type in uh, shop aprons or aprons and that video will come up. So. Um, the Real Big Sweet says, can you use an electric fan? Can you use an electric fan? Yes, you can. Um, you just have to play with the air gates to allow the, uh, to get the right amount of oxygen into the fire. Not enough to get the heat where you want it, but not enough that it over-oxygenates the steel. So. <coughs> Got milk 1061 says, how much did I miss? Only the first five welds. <laughs> no big deal though. Just in time. Just in time for the important stuff. Just the just in the nick of business. All right. What else we got, huh? Sure. Um, is it? Let's see if I can read this out. Uh, sleepless in New York. Is it possible to shift? Oh, never mind. Sorry, I already did that. Thought you're talking about something about a power gamer part. He's just talking about the camera. Uh, Justin Wells, the blacksmithing community is the greatest community on this planet. Yep, it can be. Uh, the real big sweet is a uh, hello guys from Maryland. Sorry, have not seen you for a while. I've been sick. Hey, well, at least you're here. Glad you feel better. Honey Lane Forge says, normally I'm in the forge working while your life feed is going. Not tonight, it's relax mode. <laughs> well, someone's got to be relaxing tonight. Might as well be you. Might as well be you. Let's see, uh, Science Addict 77 said, how do you 
can tell there's too much air coming through, just experience or anything you look for? Um, what you'll notice, what you'll notice long before you get sparks is your material will keep coming out really bubbly and like, like it's just got a lot of really heavy scale on it. Um, some people attribute that to like clinkers and things like that, sticking in ash and coal. That's not what that is. That's too much oxygen coming in. So if your piece is really heavily scaling up all the time, it's got like those little blisters of scale on it. They almost turn to like little round dots all over the place on it. The more of that you have means the more oxygen you have in the fire. If it comes out hot and glowing but without any of those blisters, you've got the recipe just right. Just right. So I'll point out here real quick before I pull this out. Every time I'm heating this back up to a welding heat, which I'm watching my, I'm watching how much oxygen I'm putting in. I'm putting in just enough to get the core of that fire up to where it needs to be, but not enough in to try to burn the piece up. <coughs> but every time I put this back in, I'm putting it in like this with the high carbon steel face pointed up. I'm not poking that down in the fire because as I said, that gets hotter quicker. We want that to stay up, so this way the heat can tr radiate throughout the entire joint, including the wrought iron. So all right, it's up to a welding heat. Let's go to the anvil cam, Jess. All right, good. You there? Yep. Okay, so now we're gonna, now we're gonna turn it back up on end and go ahead and forge weld it some more. On the top, make sure she's just really good down and in there. It's all, if it's steaming a little bit, as long as it's steaming, you can forge on it. Once it stops steaming, you want to quit. Alright. Getting that face really welded in now. I'm happy about that. Um, once you make a few of these, I'd like to point this out. Once you actually make a few of these like this, you will really enjoy making your hammers this way. It takes extra time, but the result is worth it, in my opinion. We're just cleaning up these little joints just a little bit. We almost got these seams blended in. We've got them blended in on two sides. We still have two sides yet to go, though. Mike says, how much coal do you go through in a year forging full-time? Um, it varies because there's sometimes my years require more gas forge usage based upon the project at hand than what it does coal. But I was going before I had a really uh, a big gas forge and I had a real big demand on my gas forge uh, over the coal that I had doing copper work. Um, before then, I was going through about a ton of coal a year. So, I was going through 2,000 pounds of coal a year. Justin Wells says, when do you get a chance to try new techniques and make stuff that you want to make since you are a blacksmith full time? Well, it's actually very interesting. Good question. Um, so, you have to force yourself to take time to take and actually do that. I have been really bad about that because uh, family comes first for me and so it's very, it's difficult, you know, when I need to take and make sure the bills are paid and the lights are turned on and stuff. Um, it's very difficult when I see a customer's order sitting on the wayside and for me to go over here and experiment with something new. Uh, now it's been very interesting since I've gotten into YouTube and teaching and doing more instructing and things of that nature, <coughs> this is actually, believe it or not, has helped me to take a big step back from doing solid days where I have to work 16 hours a day in the shop pumping out product. Um, and so I'm getting actually more time to do things that are worthy of my skill level. Now, with that being said, um, that's going to sound real facetious, but basically I 
whether it looks like it or not on YouTube, I am actually very well trained. I'm very well versed in blacksmithing. Uh, I can put my iron against any blacksmith out there in this world, and I'm fully confident with that. Uh, whether I do something as nice or not will, base, base, will be completely based upon uh, how much more experience they have in that particular subject matter. But if you need me to forge weld two pieces of metal together, I'll get them forge welded. If you need me to weld, MIG, stick, TIG, I can do it all, okay? Except for TIG. I haven't done a lot of TIG, so well, none, actually. So that's one of the things I need to learn on, right? So I'm always learning, I'm always adapting, and that's important, right? So where I get the time to do stuff that I want to do is I've had to say no to production work. And I've had to say yes to items where maybe I don't make as much per hour on those items because they're not production pieces or because they're new territory or they're custom orders from people. And I get to, and at all costs, I try to make sure those people know that I'm gonna take artistic liberty with it um, and do what I think is gonna look best for that particular item. And so that's how I get that time, if you will. I get that time back to be able to experiment and do what I want to do. Oh, YouTube has definitely helped <coughs> with pushing me to think outside the box on that, that I don't have to constantly say, OK, I've got to hit out 15 items this next month at this and such and such pay rate at this many hours per day in order to make X, Y, Z dollars, have enough to put in savings, retirement, insurance, cell phone, yada, 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 um, and just kind of tightening the belt a little bit and saying, okay, I'm gonna pull back from that and then start actually using some of the skills that I've put to the wayside um, in order to just pay bills. So you have to force yourself, basically. I know those are long-winded an uh, answers, but they're good because they're good thinking spots for people who are just wanting to get into this craft and maybe you're thinking about doing this as a business because at some point, at some point, you may love making hammers, you may love making rounding hammers, right? Like that classic Brian Brazil style, like you just eat it up. There's gonna come a point that you're tired of hammering out that style hammer and you're gonna wanna do something else. And it may not even be hammers anymore. You may want to just start making hooks and try to make some hooks, right? And your business is all going to be wrapped up in that one thing that you got really good at, right? And uh, it's it, you have to force yourself. You have to say, hey, I've got to go. I've got to make this point, a uh, pivotal point for my development as a smith. And you will reach that point if you stay in it long enough. Word to the wise. Is your piece up to heat or do you have time for another question? Uh, piece is almost to heat. One more question. Okay. All right. Um, Jeremy Walker says, are treadle hammers a good start for those who can't afford to build a power hammer? Uh, I'm, I have mixed feelings on treadle hammers. A really well built and designed treadle hammer, yes, they can be a good thing. They do not, rep they are not meant to draw out material. Um, a lot of guys try to get them for that purpose, and so a really good designed treadle hammer is going to run you about fourteen or fifteen hundred bucks if you buy one from a manufacturer of them, or you can build your own for a few hundred dollars. Right? Um, I have some links to that of a real simple, basic one, and it can help draw out some stuff. Basically. <laughs> it will not replace a power hammer. A power hammer is a completely different piece of equipment. Where treadle hammers come into their own, treadle hammers come into their own when you're needing to do top tooling work. Because you can have a control blow like that where you're having both hands free to work underneath it. That can be really handy for like punching eyes and hammer heads and stuff like that. They're wonderful. They're great for stuff like that. <laughs> but if you're trying to draw out a big old 30 inch long taper, you're going to wear out your hip and your knees and, and uh, it's not going to work out very well for you. So right. uh, it's a good cheap alternative if you need like somebody a striker. So you need to set a tool 
on top of something and you need something to hit that something and you don't have a third hand around another guy to whack on it for you, they're a great option for that. All right, we're good and hot. Let's go to the anvil. All right, let's do it. Anvil cam. I'll pull it out again. Oh, darn you. Hold up there, ladies and gents. Dropped all the way to the bottom. that joint together, that face joint together. Now this is fully welded in. Um, you can take this as far as you like. If you want to blend it out completely like my main shop hammer, you'll just have to keep hammering on it to get that, to get that weld joint to fully blend in. And I'm going to hopefully show this to you all here real close like. Let me see, this is all in shot, hopefully. Let me try to zoom you all in. Can you see that, honey? Yeah, that looks good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can see this face is completely welded in. You can't see a joint there. Mm -hmm. This face here, completely welded in. You see, you can't see a joint there. Mm -hmm. But over here, this is what I'm working on. Do you see the joint there? Yeah, yeah there's kind of a line. Do you see how that line's there? That's just a little bit of lap of material, that's okay. It doesn't mean that it's not welded in. We've already discussed that. It's welded on fine. And you see how there's a little bit of a lap joint there? Mm -hmm. It's because I haven't fully tried, you know, I haven't hammered this area in this area enough. So that's what I was trying to do, is get that welded up good, uh, just to blend, blend that in. Because that right there has no weld joint. And that's because I fully forge welded that in. I didn't want it to show. Yeah, at all. Really good. See how it's all gone? Mm -hmm. That hammer face is actually back into here where I've chased that little uh, rosette, if you will. Mm -hmm. Can they see this yep. okay? Yep, that's good. Okay, uh, that's actually back into this rosette that hammer face is, and you can't even see it. So I blended that all in. Now, stay there. If you look at this one, I did blend it all in. You look right on the top. Can you see those two little knocks there? Yeah, I see them. See, that's where I cut the teeth. I didn't blend that in. Mm -hmm. uh, this hammer survived a lot, a lot, many, many months of work. Um, I don't even, I have years, just years of work, mm -hmm. and it still held up. So, but again, I left it out a little bit because I wanted to keep that as a memory. I didn't fully finish it out just so I could show that as an example. Good forethought, huh? Mm -hmm. There you go. And if you look down here, do you see how there's a bit of a, bit of a weird spot right in there? Mm -hmm. That same, that's a bird's mouth weld. There's a high carbon steel bit that goes all the way back in there. Mm -hmm. And that's what we'll be doing to the other end. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to weld that fully in either because I wanted to show my work. I wanted people to be able to see that when I explained it to them because you can't see that on this hammer. This hammer is fully welded up. There's no telltale sign whatsoever of those welds. So I'll take one last little heat and planish these two faces together, one last little forge welding heat, and then I'm going to call that it on that side. And we will actually go ahead and flip it around now and draw down the peen area a little bit. We have to draw it down a little bit so this way we can split it open for the bird's mouth and we'll draw down a high carbon steel bit. Any questions? Oh. 
There's a few new people dropping in. Everybody's just saying hi to each other. Okay, good. Um, Make everybody feel welcome. Thank you for being yes. here. Yeah, Penny Brown. She she dropped in a few minutes ago. Penny Brown, thank you. Coming by. Let's see. Uh, Mike G, I'm still amazed on the quality of stream on a high def TV. <laughs> that means we're doing something right. That means we're doing something right. So, right now I don't I don't know if there's anybody any any better as far as streaming goes, but I think we have a the best stream on YouTube as far as forging live streams go. But there's some other honorable mentions that you may want to go check out there. Um, Tim at Big Dog Forge, he does a Sunday morning live stream. And if you aren't if you aren't subscribed to Tim at Big Dog Forge, I highly recommend it. He's a really cool guy. He has a great stream. He hasn't quite put together a forging stream just yet. And uh, I hope he does that. And uh, tell him to get with me. Can Well, I got his email. I can always email him too. Um, but uh, it would be neat to see him be able to do a forging stream. I'd love to see him do a forging stream. I don't know what his internet situation is and things like that. But if he needs some help, let him know. Roy and Jessica said, <laughs> We'd be happy to happy to show him a few pointers on getting his stream set up because that would be awesome to see Tim do that. But he kind of just does a chat and catches up with you and answers questions. And he's been in the craft. I want to say he said he's been doing it for thirty some years, thirty really? thirty plus years, thirty five plus years. I think it is. Um, <clears throat> so he's a wealth of knowledge and information. And uh, definitely worth checking him out. County Lane Forge says, I do one on Saturdays as well, right? Oh, Big Dog Forge is there. Hey, you do one on, the, you do one on uh, Saturdays, huh? County Line Forge does one? Yeah, yeah that's what he okay. What time on Saturdays, County Line? Can you drop that in so everyone knows, especially if you were watching on the replays? And I'll give it a little shout out here. I would like to see it myself. Since you're doing it on a Saturday. I'm jotting it down on here, so. All right. Prepare uh, for me to show up in your stream. County Line's an avid supporter of this channel. We always greatly appreciate having him around. You said Tim's in the chat? Yeah, he did. He did. Awesome, Tim. Good to have you in the chat. He dropped us a $5 super chat. Thank you, Tim. You're awesome, brother. Greatly appreciate you. Again, I highly recommend going over, checking out Tim at Big Dog Forge for sure. I'll have to check out your uh, your channel there too, County Line Forge. You've been doing a lot of tool making, I think. I think I'm subscribed. Um, I don't get a lot of time to watch a lot of other creators, so I kind of I pick a few people here and there, and that's my that's my list for the week that I get to watch, and then I get back to the work. So, do the work, as Peter Bruner would say. County Line Forge was telling Tim that he got a billet from him and that he must say he got some drool on it. I may just dance a jig tomorrow morning on my stream. <laughs> <laughs> now everybody needs to go watch that. We need to see a grown man dance a drink, uh, uh, dance a jig on a Saturday. Listen, New York says, call in the dog. <laughs> Gotta call in the dog. Uh, John McCann says, if you will, if you grind it, will it show a line or grind smooth? It'll grind smooth. So, uh, one thing you'll notice is that the, just like whenever you have a softer material, so um, say you do a bolster on something, a piece of steel. Now, I don't know from experience when it comes to knives. I do know that I've done some different mixes of putting copper with steel. If you grind a softer material that's right next to a harder material, the softer material will eat away quicker. Um, so you'll have to focus more of your grinding on the high carbon steel bit where it was at and then blend that back off into the softer material. But no, it shouldn't show a line. Got milk 1061 says, what type of steel are you making the hammer faces out of, and what's your favorite type of steel to make hammers out of? 
1045 is my favorite type of steel to make hammers out of. I especially like wrought iron with 1045 faces welded in. It's a beautiful material. The faces in this particular project are going to be 1095 faces welded onto the wrought iron. That is not recommended for me. <coughs> you have to push that steel to its absolute limit to bring uh, the wrought iron up to a welding heat or like a medium welding heat. It's not even as high as it could go in welding heat. So I highly suggest 1045 for wrought iron if you're going to undertake wrought iron. Bring this up to heat, and I'm going to planish those things out. We can go over the anvil, Jess. All right. Good? Yep, we're doing still see me on the other camera? Yeah, the main camera is still Are you going to see me live? Okay. You said there's something wrong with the secondary cam? Yeah, I'm trying to get it figured out here. Okay, watch it. Okay. Don't drop both feet. Okay. Is anybody commenting? Are yeah, still live? Yeah, just had it froze. Forge, hand down, you're live. Just and is frozen. Okay, good. Maybe I restart it. Turn on. Good. on the main cam here so I can talk yep. to people. We're on the main cam. Okay, so Jessica's working out. Uh, whatever happened with the other thing, I don't know, could have been a wire, could be some heat issues there on the camera, we'll see. So now I'm going to forge down the peen end a little bit of this hammer. We've got the high carbon steel face welded all up. That's in good shape. Now we're going to heat the peen end up and do some, just do some drawing down. All right, what are we doing? We are in some troubleshooting here, so. Okay. One minute. One minute. All right. All right, I think we're good. We're good? Good? Yeah, yeah. Can you see me? Yep, yep. The hands, the hands running, running all over the place. place. Yep. Yep. Can you all, Can you all see, see my hand, hand running all over the place? Doing a little happy jig. Just, just a happy jig. jig. Okay. Okay. Let, me see. Let me make sure this isn't focused. Give me a second. Alrighty. Let me see. Let me make sure this isn't focused. Give me a second. Every time you shut it off, you have to make sure it's back in focus. Every time you shut it off, you have to make sure it's back in focus. Alright. We in focus. So, I'm done forge welding the hammer face in. Now I'm going to draw the peen down in just a simple taper. Not going real far, but we'll draw the peen down to roughly maybe half inch or three eighths of an inch across, if you will. And, and that's 12.5 mil or 9.5 mil. For those, for those across the pond, we're, we're going to draw that down. down. And then, and then I'm actually going to have Jessica, Jessica uh, hold the piece upright for me so I can use a slit chisel and slit open the bird's mouth portion of it in preparation for that weld. I will have to have to heat up the high carbon steel again 
and forge down a little bit that then I can cut off and insert in that bird's mouth to make the weld. If you're doing this at your own home shop, do it in the vise. Cut the bird's mouth in the vise. You don't have to do this like I'm doing it. It's just that Jessica is over approximately where my vise is. So yeah. it, would, it would be no bueno to go put it over there. If you guys are getting an echo, try refreshing. I think I fixed it. I had to mute uh, one extra audio. Thing, so yep, yeah, try refreshing. Echo. Some people are saying there's an echo and some aren't. So refresh and let me know if there's still um, a problem. Yeah, just refresh the stream. You might have to back out and then come back in. I tell you what, forging is a real breeze if you don't have technical issues. <laughs> you know, I would have already been close to being done by now if it wasn't for tech issues. Yeah. And having to repeat myself. Well, it doesn't matter. I think we're squared away now. We're Say, squared away now? Everybody saying it's good now. Okay, good. So right. this is the thing about live. You can't edit that out. If you have camera malfunctions, you can't refilm a clip. It's just Again, you have to roll with it. So, benefits and downsides of being live. Donkey Sports. Thought I had a visit from Timothy Leary for a minute. There are those of you of my age that will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm afraid that one's over my head. <laughs> All right, yep, good now. Thanks, Brett354 and Big Dog Forge and Billy Strong. And awesome. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for letting us know. All right, so you said it's about my turn to help you? Uh, no, I'm going to forge it down first. Forge it and down. then it'll be in the next heat or so. Okay. Jessica will help me. All right. Bring it out. We'll make sure this is still in focus. We're good. Let me try to zoom it in a little bit better. A little better, 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 better. Good to go. Uh, rod iron, whenever you're doing a lot of cross sectional change, you need to keep it up at a high heat. So it would be the same color temperature, if you look at it, what mild steel would be at a welding heat. That's how hot you need to get it if you're doing a lot of cross-sectional changing, like drawing out. Otherwise, you're going to get splits and fractures in it. It'll fracture on you or fray out at the end. You want to keep that together. So basically, you're welding it as you forge it out kind of sort of that way. That's the simplest layman's terms I can put on it. So let's go to the anvil, Jessica. All right. Um, and this stuff does like to squirt. Like I said, it likes to squirt out a lot of that silica, that slag that's in it as you forge. So wear a nice apron if you can. to go more in one direction than I am in the other. Put this thing towards down. And correcting the side swell a little bit. And now it's what I consider too cool to continue forging at that vigorousness. So now I will take it back in for another heat and draw that down just a little more. People are commenting they knew uh, what Coffee Sports was talking about. And then Susan Ellis said, apparently some of us are old enough to be rowing just as parents. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's saying something. I'm 30 this year, so. And I think there's a lot of people probably old enough to be our parents that watch our channel on the day, daily, so. Yeah. Yep. Graham said, fish lipping needed for the insert. What's that? The fish lipping is needed for the insert? Uh, no. Um, or, oh. You have to cut a fish mouth into the end of it. So you have to cut it down and open it up slightly so you can put your high carbon bit in there and then close those lips on it and then forge weld it up. 
Um, it has a little bit of carp's mouth on the end right now. That's just because I wasn't hitting it full mustard. Um, <laughs> but again, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to cut into it anyhow. So um, that can be taken care of with just dressing the peen area back up a little bit. Billy Strong says, drink some water, Roy. I've been working in the hottest part of a still mill all week, and we don't want you falling out during a live stream. <laughs> no chances of that. No chances of that. But I'll take your advice. Thank you for the reminder. Big Dog Ford says 60 this year. You got a head start on Roy, then. I'm glad that you're 60 and I'm not, Big Dog Ford. I'm pretty happy. Um, I consider myself fortunate uh, to have gotten to the age of 30. I've done a lot of stupid stuff in my 30 years, however small that's been um, in retrospective, that uh, could have ended very badly for me. So I'm just thankful that I'm here. I've got all my appendages, my eyes. Most of my health is there. So, you know, again, I'm just thankful for that, you know, at this age. And I think anybody at any age, if you're given even the next day, you should be thankful for it. Mm -hmm. So we're never guaranteed our tomorrow. Nope. I can walk out tomorrow, perfectly healthy man, and get struck by a bus. However unlikely that may be, yeah. my day may just come a call in that way. And still happens to some people. Yeah, it still happens. So. can't plan those things. You just be thankful for the time you got. Let's see. Uh, Dayspring Model Works says, yep, 33 this year. Awesome. I'm seeing who's around your age here. So, Tommy yeah. Lynn Orange says, 32 this year for me. Awesome. And everybody else is 40 or above, mostly. Yeah. yeah. See, I have a sneaking suspicion we have a bunch of old boots in the house. <laughs> I say that in the most nice, loving, kind way. Listen, New York says I'm 26 with several years of experience, and I mean several. That's good. It means you got started early. It's something you enjoy doing. Yep. I think he means life experience there, Sugar. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be old in order to have some years of experience under your belt especially in today's times. All right, let's go back to the anvil. All right. And we'll forge on this a little more. Okay. I'm going to pay attention to this as I take it down to this last little bit here. I don't want to go too far with it. I still want that rod iron to have some meat there. Just the face squared up just to that fuzz. Just because. Just because. Okay. That's doing pretty good. I usually don't brush this heavy. I'm just cleaning it up just so you guys can see what's going on all the transitions and the smoothness of the form and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you can yeah. see what's going on there. So that's basically, that's basically what we've got. Looking good? Mm, yep, sure is. Okay. So now with the next heat, we'll come out and we'll actually cut this open. So I'm going to take a light heat on it. Again, bring this up to, ooh, I don't know, a doll orange or so in color and I will have Jessica hold it with a pair of tongs in the upright position like so. And then I will split it with a slitting chisel. So I will literally come in and actually, you know, slit it with a slitting chisel and drive that down in there to make room for our wedge that will forge, high carbon steel wedge. Is it, do I need an apron on for that or is it going to be No, no, it's going to, it won't be splatting on you. It's just, it's light, it's light work. So, I'll get that prepped. Mike G 
says, I'm 32 and expecting our first child in July. I bet the anticipation is driving you crazy. Awesome. <laughs> His first child? Yep. Let's all have a moment of silence for Mike G. Your life will never be the same, pal, but that's in a good way, I promise. <laughs> I got to tease you a little bit, buddy. Got to tease you a little bit. You'll never regret having kids. I don't regret not one of mine. So, All three of my kids do anything for County Lane Fort says, okay, I lied, I'm lighting the forge. It's an addiction. No way I can watch a blacksmith work and not want to work myself. Oh, well. <laughs> Game in. Well, there you go. It's like, I gotta get started. Get yourself some wrought iron, some high carbon steel. Let's get on it. Your stream needs to pick up right after mine ends. <laughs> we'll just transition to you doing forge welding right at the end. Paul Ellis, glad you made it. Paul Ellis, good to have you here. Big Dog Forge says, taking my lovely wife of 37 years to dinner. Gotta go. God bless and be safe. Awesome. Take care of her, Tim. You have an awesome evening. Make sure everybody go check out Tim Big Dog Forge. Um, subscribe to him if you haven't already. And watch his stream on Sunday morning. It's about 11 o'clock here, uh, Eastern Standard Time. It's like 1045 and 11 o'clock here. Eastern Standard Time when he comes on on a Sunday morning. So uh, definitely highly recommend it. Check him out. All right, honey. Yes. We're good and hot. Okay, I need to come up over yep. here. Yep, come over here, would you? Brian Lee, but Roy, your kids aren't old enough to be major pain in the butt yet. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Is that a warning? Yeah, I don't know. Well, you know what I mean? I guess they get into, I guess they get to be more painful as they get older, maybe. I don't know. But uh, right now they have their trying days. They have their days. Oh, all right, so you're just going to take and hold it. Did you switch the anvil cam? It's on the anvil cam. Okay. We've got some time here, so. Okay. Okay. Give me a second. You're just going to hold it as tight as you can. Squeeze that as tight as you can. All right. Okay. And hold it flat like that. There we go. All right, so now all we're going to do is I'm going to find the center of it, and I'm going to cut straight across. Preferably. Now, you want to make sure you run this cut as straight down, up and down as you can in this. You don't want to cut to one one side more than the other. Uh, you'll regret that if you do. I make a pretty deep cut because I want that bit to really go back in there and I want those lips to grab it. So you're going to cut down approximately three quarters of an inch. And call that good. So now I'll give it a little brush and go ahead, honey, go back. Right. You're good to go. Okay, hopefully you all can see that. Mm -hmm. Good? Yeah. So I cut in um, roughly about half an inch there. Uh, you can go a little deeper with it. You can go up to three quarters of an inch deep if you like. Um, but uh, so that's 12.5 mil to what is it 18 or 19 mil somewhere in there somebody ought to answer in the comment section chuck that out whatever that is deep in metric and you want it to go completely across the entire piece mm -hmm. <coughs> now that is ready so what we'll do now is we'll take a little bit of flux just a little bit and I'm going to put it just on the inside surfaces there of the mouth and right on the ends. You don't need a ton of it, just enough to make it look all foamy at the mouth. Make it look like it's got rabies. It's a bird with rabies. Okay? Now that'll just get set to the side <coughs> somewhere. If I can find a place, good place. Here it is. Yep, we're just going to set that off to one side, no particular place. And now we're going to forge down. This is what we forged out our hammer face from. We're going to take the same material stock, 
and we're just going to forge that down into a bit, a small little wedge, almost like a splitting wedge to drive into that hammer face, if you will. Nice thing is this has been sitting on top of the forge hood, so it's already kind of hot. Um, I can fill it through the gloves, and you know me with no filling in my hands. Uh, if I can fill it through the gloves, it's pretty spicy. So it won't take too long to get this hot. It'll definitely take a lot longer to get it forged down, though. Uh, they said yes, three-quarter inch is 19 millimeter. Okay, good. Um, real quick to point that out, you'll hear me say stuff, um, <coughs> give out metric equivalents in my videos. I'm doing that off the top of my head. I do not usually go off metric. It's something I'm trying to learn. But the stock sizes that are available to you in the UK or across the world may be completely different than what 18 mil is or 19 mil is, or it may not be the exact millimeter. Maybe all you can get is maybe there's a 16, 18, 20 mil, and you can't get 19 mil. Don't stress about that. There's nothing that we are doing that is like NASA approved here. Nothing that we do in blacksmithing, I don't care how good you get, is never going to be perfect. None of it's ever going to be perfect. And so if I spout out a measurement, it's not an absolute. It is a measurement I chose for that particular project. So if it varies plus or minus a quarter of an inch on a lot of the things that I make, you're fine. You're fine. Or six mil, if you will. You're fine. This isn't this isn't machinist work. You do not have to be that accurate with your measurements. So <coughs> hopefully that helps. Be as accurate to your own liking. However accurate you want to be, good for you. Alright, we are an hour and 46 minutes in. We have 53 watchers. Good, 53 watchers. Good, good, good. So, um, I want to get, I want to get to a point to where I got this welded in. So I'm going to try to see if I can do that. Uh, you're free to come and go as you please. I want to get a point tonight to have that face. Uh, I want to have that thing completed. We won't get around to punching the eye of it and stuff this stream, but we'll do the punching and drifting and final shaping of it next live stream, next Friday night live stream, et cetera. Right, honey? Okay, yep. Yep, that's the plan. Okay. So I'll get this good and hot, this high carbon steel up, and get the forging on it here. Questions? Does anybody have questions about forge welding? Forge welding, what I'm doing here, something you saw me do this week that you have questions on? Manga 12 says this is a claw hammer or a smithing hammer. This is going to be a smithing hammer. This is a Scandinavian style cross beam hammer. It's a very small hammer we're making because I'm going to use it in lock work, um, basically. Uh, I do have some lock making videos coming up very soon. Um, I'm filming a whole new series for YouTube coming up, and I'm pretty excited about it. And it's going to allow me to tackle a lot bigger projects. And I hope everybody can follow along with those and do pretty well. And then I've also got some artistic projects coming out, which will be more of a, uh, I'm calling it uh, the Master Series. And it's going to basically be my challenge to myself to master the skills that I already have and to push myself further than what I have been so far in the last 10 years of my life. So it ought to be really interesting. Those won't be how-tos. Those are basically going to be me letting you in the door and watching me put something together that takes advanced level skill set to do. Hopefully that makes sense. Susan Ellis, how do you keep three kids occupied while you do these live streams? <laughs> On Monday night, they actually sit in the kitchen. Ma'am all, ma all right now is yeah. feeding them full of sugar and cupcakes uh -huh. and creams and, and yeah. uh, watching them movies and giving them baths and mm -hmm. yeah. All sorts of mammal stuff. All sorts of mammal stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then what? Mondays, Jess, what did yeah. you say? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm oh. over talking you, baby. I'm okay. sorry, sweetheart. 
Um, yeah, Monday nights they uh, just sit in our kitchen on their bean bags and watch a movie. So while we're doing the business live stream, so yeah. So real quick, um, real quick, I just want to point this out, and uh, for all those that don't know it, I'm really sweet on my wife. Um, she puts up with me on the daily. She is my right arm. She is my left arm. Uh, I, I tell her all the time if she were to leave me, I'd only be 20% of a person. And uh, that is my wholehearted truth on there. And you really, 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 I would thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you take and shout out to Jessica and thank her for all of her hard work of putting this stream together. Um, she spent four days, was it, honey? So, yeah. About four solid days of work trying to figure out these computer issues, and neither one of us are computer experts. We are not computer people. No. Uh, although we are on it all the time, we, are, we don't know how to do code and all this other type stuff. Um, and Jessica, bless her heart, she, has, she, she worked her tail off uh, for me to try to make this a possibility tonight. So make sure that you give her a big, big round of applause. Yes, I'm digging for brownie points. I'm doing everything a man of my stature and lowly income level position, can, right? can do. So lots of thumbs up. Come on, ladies and gents. Help a brother out. <laughs> Today's great model works. Thanks for putting up with Roy, Jess. Yes, yes. Thank her for that. She's put up with me. We're coming up July 16th is our wedding anniversary. Um, on July 16th, we've been married 11 years. Oh, we've known each other for 13. So, yep. it's pretty awesome. It is. Uh, let's see here. Manga12 asks, do you guys ever argue about business? I know my parents argue business, and it did spill out into after hours. Uh, we do argue. Um, basically, there's stress. There's a lot of stress that comes with this. Um, just doing business, running a business together. Uh, but we've made, a, we've made quite a bit of commitments. We've gotten out of hand before, but you know, we've pretty much made a commitment to each other that you know, it's our relationship with God first, our relationship with each other second, our relationship with our kids third, and then our relationship with business and the rest of the world fourth. Um, so that's kind of like our family standard and when we get that out of balance usually somebody says hey you need to get back in check you need to put this back in check and we're both pretty good jessica she's a bottler she doesn't come out yeah. outright and say it but she usually has a blow up every now and then on me um that's just kind of how she does it me i'm a loud mouth and i'm easy to upset and unravel um, so I'm usually the first person to know that something's amiss and we get it straightened up. So yeah, you know, we have plenty of fights, uh, yeah. if you will, little quarrels. I guess but we kind of embrace too, like that we each kind of have our own departments. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, I finally yep. come around to like letting Roy run things like when he, you know, he knows what he needs to get as far as equipment or yep. builds or Things she like used that. to micromanage me all the time out in the shop until yeah. I basically told her that this is my shop, this is my domain. Your house is in there, my house is out here, mm -hmm. and you know, we, you know, we, you don't know what I have to go through, and I don't fully know what you have to go through. Let's come to the middle and talk about it, and and that's worked pretty good for us mm -hmm. thus far. Yeah, I was so. gonna say, um, actually, doing the blacksmith cheat sheet was actually kind of like a relief for me because. Like Roy says, I am a micromanager. And when Roy first started selling stuff on Etsy, like I wanted to tell him exactly what to sell because I could do the research and see what was selling. And like I tried to tell him, and he was just like, I don't yeah. want to make that. Anybody want so. to take a guess how that went for? <laughs> yeah, so um, just being able to do the research and like put it out there, and I'm starting to get the feedback from you know, the people who purchased the cheat sheet. And they're like, this is really helpful. You know, I'm going to use this. Like. I enjoy that because, um, you know, Roy's, I had to take it with a grain of salt when I told Roy that information. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh. All right, this is hot, honey. All so right. let's go over the anvil, and then we'll actually segue into our little blacksmith uh, website and stuff. Okay, we good? Yep, we're good. All right. How much do you think that is going to weigh? Uh, it'll weigh around eight ounces. 
pulses when it's done. Got that all forged out there. So now you guys can see that wedge there. Good? Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the other piece. I'm going to check it for fit. So I need to make it a little thinner yet because it's too clunky to fit in there. I don't know if everybody can see that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hopefully it's in focus. It's too clunky and thick to actually fit in there. So we still need to draw that down thinner in order to knock it in there. Yes. Okay. Yes, Mom, it's all to say eight ounces. Peter Trippett says tiny eight ounces. Yep. Doesn't require a whole lot. Heavy Hammer Forge says, why this type of iron? Why wrought iron? Yes. Okay. Um, rod iron because it's a traditional way of